you, Nancy. Can we welcome Nancy back? I don't like doing this without our Nancy. She's a blessing to us. Well, thank you for joining us for worship tonight. Uh, why don't we pray and ask the Lord to bless our time together, and then we can stand and sing together. God, you are good. We thank you for uh, the rain. God, we thank you for creation. God, and how it shows us something about who you are, that you are powerful, that you are creative, that you are sovereign. God, that you are good. And Lord, we thank you for our church, that this group of worshipers that you have brought together tonight, uh, Lord, we know it's not by accident that any one of us is here. So we ask that you would share with each and every one of us what, what you have given us to take away from tonight, God, an encounter with you, an encounter with a brother or a sister, God, an encouragement from your word, a, a conviction um, about something that needs to, we need to grow in, whatever that may be, God. Um, we, we ask that you wouldn't allow us to waste tonight, to take it for granted or to miss something that you have. Uh, speak through your word, through the fellowship, through the truth of these songs, through Pastor Andy, through the word of a friend as we're just hanging out and chatting afterwards, God. Uh, do what you, only you can do and what you want to do with our time here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's stand and worship the Lord together. Oh, worship the King, oh, glorious above. They sing. His wonderful love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, the pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. Oh, tell of His might, oh, sing of His grace, whose robe is the light. Whose canopy space His chariots of wrath The deep thunder clouds form Dark is His path On the wings of the storm Thy bountiful care What tongue can recite With breeze in the air it shines in the light It streams from the hills It descends to the plain And sweetly distills in the dew and the rain The children of dust And feeble as frail In thee do we trust nor find thee to fail thy mercies how tender how firm to the end our maker defender redeemer and friend Within my heart a melody Jesus whispers sweet and low Fear not I am with thee Peace be still In all of thy seven flow Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Sweetest name I know singing as I go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife. Discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken strings. Stood the slumber chords again. I 
Feasting on the riches of His grace Resting beneath the sheltering wing Always looking on His smiling face That is why I shout and sing Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Sweetest name I know I go Soon he's coming back to welcome me Far beyond the starry sky I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown I shall reign with him on high Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Sweetest name I know Feels my every longing Keeps me singing as I go Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Sweetest name I know Feels my every longing Keeps me singing as I go Good singing. We sing about Jesus because Jesus is the center of everything. Jesus is the center of all of human history. It's right that we would lift our voices and sing about Jesus. Isn't there something sweet when you get to do that? I think there's something just amazing, uh, um, uh, uh, wonderfully sweet when we have this privilege of singing about our Lord. Well, open your Bible to Psalm 139. We're going to use Psalm 139 for our prayer time tonight. We're going to use verses 1 through 6, and then we're going to jump down to 13 through 18. Psalm 139, 1 through 6, and then we'll jump down to 13 through 18. <clears throat> Search me, O God, and know my heart. And the word of the Lord says this, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. <clears throat> You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You stretch out my path and my lying down. You search out my path and my lying down and are all acquainted with all my ways. Even before words on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in before and behind. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Verse 13, for you formed me in my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in the secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. This is the word of the Lord. Isn't it good that we're in the hands of the all-knowing God? God who knows. God knows everything about us. He's known us before we were even born. He's known all of our words and all of our ways since before he created anything. God has known us, and he knows us still. And he knows everything about us. He knows the good, the bad, the ugly. And he loves us. And he loves us. He knows us, and yet He still loves us. Isn't that amazing? Don't you think that's the most wonderful thing that you can possibly think about? Is the fact that God knows us. He knows all of our junk. He knows all of our garbage. He knows the stuff that goes through our minds that we wouldn't want anybody else to ever see or know about. And He loves us still. That is grace. 
And that is the amazing God who we worship. Let's come to him in prayer right now. Lord, we thank you that you know us. You have searched us out. There isn't anything we do that takes you by surprise. There's not a thought that forms in our mind that catches you unaware, that you haven't been fully present and fully aware of since you, before you even created the world. And knowing us as you do, we would expect you to push us away and reject us, and yet, knowing us as you do, your Son, the second person of the Trinity, came, took on human flesh, and died to make us yours forever. And we are amazed, and we are stunned, and we are, we are awestruck. We are awestruck at the wonder of what you have done for wretched, poor sinners like us. How good you are, how gracious you are. How can we not sing our hearts out to you? How can we not rejoice in the fact that you, you have done this for us? How can we not live lives that conform as best we can, as stumbling and bumbling as we can? We, we try our best to live our lives in a way that pleases you. We fall short, we skin our knees, we fall down, you pick us up. You pull us back up, you set us back on our feet, you dust us off, you say, do it again, do it again. It's okay, I'm with you. Lord, how awesome are you that you would cleanse us of our sins and then come to live in us and put us into fellowship by your Spirit. We are amazed. We are astounded at your graciousness. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, hear our prayer of gratitude tonight. Help us as we worship you. Help us as we open our hearts and minds willingly to the work of your Holy Spirit and the work of your word. Hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Well, as we stand and continue in worship, let's praise the Lord for his great love to us, his great grace to us, his great mercy that far exceeds our ability to sin is his mercy towards us. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. Remember no wrongs we had Omniscient, all-knowing He counts not their sum Thrown into a sea Without bottom or shore Our sins, they are many His mercy is more Praise the Lord So tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the
riches of kindness he lavished on me. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the
Lord, we thank you that you gave us a song to sing, yeah. voices to sing it with. God, that you are on the throne, and anything you send our way is by the hand of our loving Father who knows us inside and out and knows exactly what we need. Lord, we thank you for worshiping together as your family, for singing as a congregation, God, this little foretaste of heaven. Mm -hmm. That one day around the throne, there's going to be people farther than we can see singing all these good old songs for all of eternity. Mm -hmm. We thank you for a little taste of that tonight. Mm -hmm. Speak through your words. Speak through Pastor Andy, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Open your Bible, Judges chapter 15. Judges chapter 15. We're going to be looking tonight at the Philistines' worst nightmare. His name is Samson. And he's a surprising, he's a surprising instrument in the hands of God. But I want to go back to that song that we sang, His Mercy is More. You know, that's, that, is, that is it, isn't it? His Mercy is More. That's what we were talking about. And I, I'm reading a very interesting book. I commend it to you. It's Philip Yancey's Where the Light Fell. It's an autobiography of Philip Yancey. And he tells the story about his, his grandfather, uh, the, uh, the father of his mother. And his grandfather had been a man who was supporting, I think, five children working in Philadelphia, had been a hard worker, had uh, worked a couple of jobs, I think, and one day alcohol took him. Alcohol just overtook him. And suddenly he wasn't the same man. He became a miserable individual to live with. He actually commanded his wife to leave, and she left the last time that Yancey's mother saw her mother was walking down a street with two suitcases going away from their house. And the man was so miserable to live with, the children had to go live with other family members. And then one day he just disappeared. He just went off someplace. Nobody knew where and nobody frankly cared where he had gone. He was gone for years. And one day he showed back up. And Yancey's mother didn't want anything to do with him. The other children didn't either. But he showed up with this amazing story. And he said, I was literally drunk in the gutter. And he said, when I woke up and came to my senses, I realized I was hungry and I needed food. So he said, I knew that I could go to the Salvation Army and they would feed me. But the cost of getting a meal ticket was to sit through a service where somebody had to preach. So he said, I was hungry and I needed food, so I went to the Salvation Army. I sat through the service. A guy preached. At the end, he gave an invitation. And he said, I went forward, and the only reason I went forward was because I thought it was the polite thing to do. If they were going to feed me a meal, the least I could do was do something for them. He said, I went forward. And they, they explained the gospel to me, and they asked me to pray the sinner's prayer. And he said, for no other reason than to be polite, I prayed the sinner's prayer, and something on the inside of me exploded and changed. And he said, I have not been the same since that time. He had left alcohol. He got a job. His kids didn't believe it. But they watched him. And over the years, they came to understand that what had happened to him was true. Because his mercy is more, you know? His mercy is more. He's the life-changing God. And, and grace cannot be explained. Grace is God bursting into our world to overtake us right where we are, who we are in the midst of the depth of who we are, God breaks into our world with grace and changes lives. He just, he just does it. Do you know that this is the best religion in the world? <laughs> Do, has it dawned on you that every other, every other religion on the face of the planet tells you you've got to perform to earn your way to God, and Christianity stands and says, no, it doesn't work that way. His mercy is more. It's grace. It's grace bursting into our lives at the most unexpected moment. 
through the most unlikely people in ways that we don't even understand. And one day we find ourselves in the grip of grace. And then we live our lives from there in a totally different way because the change comes from the inside out, you know. Christianity is not a religion about changing the outside in. It's, an, it's a religion that tells us that he changes the inside out. And that's the way we are. It's not a performance-based place, you know. We, should, you, should you live a godly life? Of course you ought to live a godly life. What else would you do after the inside has been healed? Why wouldn't the outside be godly, right? But it's grace. His mercy really is more. I love that song. Jordan sang that song, and I thought, you couldn't go better with tonight's message, buddy. You could not go better with tonight's message, because tonight we're going to find out about grace. We're going to find out about God taking a guy who absolutely is not interested in doing God's will and using him as an instrument to become the worst nightmare of the enemies of God's people. This man's name is Samson. The word of the Lord says this, after some days, this is uh, Judges 15, after some days at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson went to his wife with a young goat. He went to visit his wife with a young goat. And he said, I will go into my wife in the chamber. But her father would not allow him to go in. Her father said, I really thought that you had utterly hated her, so I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please take her instead. And Samson said, this time I shall be innocent in regard to the Philistines when I do them harm. So Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took torches, and he turned them tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of tails. And then he set fire to the torches and let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and set fire to the stacked grain and the standing grain as well as to the olive orchards. And the Philistines said, who has done this? And they said, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. And Samson said to them, if this is what you do, I swear I will be avenged on you, and after that I will quit. And he struck them hip and thigh with a great blow, and he went down and stayed at the cleft of the rock of Edom. Then the Philistines came up and encamped in Judah and made a raid on Lehi. And the men of Judah said, why have you come up against us? And they said, we have come up to bind Samson to do to him as he did to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, do you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you have done to us? And he said to them, as they did to me, so I have done to them. And they said to him, we've come down to bind you that we may give you into the hands of the Philistines. And Samson said to them, swear to me that you will not attack me yourselves. And they said to him, no, we will only bind you and give you into their hands. We will surely not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. And when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. And then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became as flax that had caught fire, and his bonds melted off his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, and put out his hand and took it, and with it he struck a thousand men. And Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, have I struck down a thousand men. And as soon as he had finished speaking, he threw the jawbone out of his hand, and that place was called Ramoth-Lehi. And he was very thirsty, and he called upon the Lord and said, You've granted me this great salvation by the hand of your servant, and shall I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? God split open the hollow place that's at Lehi, and water came out from it. And when he drank, his spirit returned, and he revived. Therefore, the name of the place is called en Hakore, and it is at Lehi to this day. And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. 
This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. It is powerful. And it encourages our heart. It pierces. It pierces to the deepest part of us. It talks to us. Just like it did to uh, Yancey's grandfather. On the spur of the moment, unexpectedly, your word can leap into our hearts, leap into our minds, and go straight to the heart. And we pray that you'll help us tonight. We need that teaching ministry of the Spirit tonight. Use this piece of Scripture tonight to encourage us, to strengthen us, to help us. You know what we need. The preacher doesn't know what anybody in the congregation needs, but the Spirit of God does. So come and help us tonight, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Samson, the weakest strong man the world has ever known. Samson was the weakest strong man the world has ever known. On the outside, he's a lion. On the inside, he's a clown. Is he the least likely instrument that God has ever chosen to do his will? I don't think so. But he'd have to at least be in the, in the rogues gallery, wouldn't he? Of those who inexplicably in spite of all their faults, in spite of all their weaknesses, God picks up and weaves into his plan and uses in a marvelous way, that would be Samson. Samson was gifted with everything necessary to save Israel from the hands of the Philistines, as we learned when we studied chapter 13. But last week, when we got to chapter 14, we found out something different about Samson. Even though he had all those gifts, even though God had given him everything he needed, To fulfill the ministry, Samson was not interested in the ministry that God had called him to. Samson was interested in satisfying his own lusts. And where does that leave us? If you read chapter 13, you think, wow, this is really going to be great. God has given this guy everything. God has given him strength. The Spirit of the Lord rushes upon him, begins to stir him when he's a young man from his mother's womb, he's set apart for God's special use. He's sanctified. He is, he is a, a Nazarene. Uh, he, he, is, he has this Nazarite vow. Samson has everything going for him. And yet, when we come to chapter 14, we start scratching our heads saying, how does this work? This guy has all these gifts, but he doesn't seem to care about any of that. And we come to tonight's passage, and we find out That God picks up Samson and uses him not because of who Samson is, but in spite of who Samson is. This is the glory of God. Where does it leave us? Is God's purpose for Samson stymied? Has his intention for Samson and Israel become completely frustrated because of Samson's unfaithfulness? Not at all. In chapter 15, we watch as God weaves Samson's weakness into his purpose. God would use Samson to fulfill his plan despite Samson's overwhelming self-centeredness. God uses Samson. The big idea we're dealing with tonight is simply this, and I hope this will be encouraging to you. God's purpose cannot be frustrated by our foolishness. Can I get an amen? God's purpose cannot be frustrated by our foolishness. That's the lesson of chapter 15. Here's the movements we're going to to move through tonight. Verses 1 through 8, Samson strikes his first blow. Verses 9 through 17, he becomes the Philistines' worst nightmare. And in verses 18 and 20, he is the revived servant, the revived servant. So let's begin in verses 1 through 8, where we find Samson striking this first blow. Now, coming out of chapter 14, we understand that Samson had uh, talked his father and mother into arranging for his marriage to a Philistine young woman. And we saw that last week. We don't need to go back through it. You know the story. You guys have been through the Bible many times, I'm sure. But you know that Samson's wedding didn't turn out as planned, that Samson Uh, gave a riddle to the 30 Philistine invited guests that were there. And Samson said, if you can guess the riddle, I'll give you 30 changes of clothes. 
If uh, you can't guess it, you give me 30 changes of clothes. And the Philistines, who could not figure out what the riddle was, snuck around and went in the back door, went through the back door with Samson's wife and convinced her to tell them the answer to the riddle. And so Samson loses the riddle. And he goes out, he, he slaughters Philistines, he pays off the debt, and he leaves in a huff. He is so angry, he leaves without consummating the marriage. He leaves without consummating the marriage. That's where we pick the story up in 15. After some days, after he has chilled out, after he has cooled down, at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson went to visit his wife with a young goat. And he said, I will go into my wife's chamber. But her father would not allow him to go in. And her father said, I really thought that you utterly hated her. So I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please take her instead. Now, this is an interesting thing, isn't it? I mean, here you've got Samson goes to visit this woman. He takes a goat. Why, why does he take a goat with him, right? It's not a pet. I mean, it's, it's something. It's a gift, right? But what's going on here? In order to understand what's going on here, we have to understand that Samson is in a particular kind of marriage arrangement. In those days, there was a marriage arrangement that's very different from the way that we think about marriage. One of the ways, one of the arrangements for a marriage was that you married the wife, but the wife did not leave her home to go live with the husband. She did not leave to go to the husband's house. She continued to stay with her parents. And it was understood that the husband had the right to make conjugal visits. And the proper gift for a conjugal visit was a young goat. And so what is, what is, I know it sounds strange. But think about it. We find this all the way back in the book of Genesis, don't we? You remember Judah, uh, the, one of Jacob's sons? You remember that his, his daughter-in-law, Tamar, is uh, uh, pretending to be a prostitute beside the road in order to entice him to produce offspring? And he comes by thinking that she's a cult prostitute. And he says to her, can I come in to you? And she says, what are you willing to give me? And what does he say he's going to give her? A young goat. This is the price, the gift that you bring for a conjugal visit. You guys get off easy because you just need to buy roses. What if you had to get a young goat? Right? So, so here's the deal. He shows up. He says, I'm in this marriage arrangement. This, arrangement. this woman and I are married. The marriage hasn't been consummated. I want to do that. He shows up with a goat in his hand and says, I want to go into my wife. And her, her father and his father-in-law, her father says, no, you can't do that. I've, she's not married to you anymore. I, I gave her to your best man. How about that? I, I gave her to your companion at the wedding. Why in the world would he do that? Well, he explains why he did that. Samson had left in a huff without consummating the marriage. And so the guy, the, the, the father-in-law says, he must really hate her after she, she gave away his riddle and he had to pay that, that debt off. He is done with her forever. Well, what am I going to do with this girl? Well, I'll give her to his best man. And so this is what the father-in-law has done. Now the father-in-law says, now here's what we're going to do. I've got this other daughter. Wouldn't you hate to be the older daughter? The father says, why don't you take the young one? She's better looking anyway. Right? What in the world is going on here? Our Bible gives us a hand. Our Bible tells us about this. Do you remember, do you remember uh, Jacob and Laban? Do you remember how Laban did a bait and switch? Do you know what a bait and switch is? Okay, I used to be in the grocery business, and bait and switch is prohibited by law in the United States. What that means is that you advertise a product at a really cheap price, and when people get to your store, you don't have it, so you sell them a more expensive product in place of it. That's a bait and switch. And so this guy is trying to do the bait and switch. Only Samson is not nearly as agreeable as Jacob was. 
Because when the father-in-law does this, Samson says, well, if that's the way it's going to be, I'm going to take it out on the Philistines. Don't you find that to be a curious detail? I mean, why wouldn't he take it out on the father-in-law, right? Now, now, why does the father-in-law make this offer in the first place? He makes this offer because Samson and his family have paid the bride price. He's in debt to Samson. He owes him a bride. And so he makes this offer, and Samson says, you're the guy who messed this up. So why doesn't Samson say, I'm going to bust your chops? And the answer is in 14.4. 14.4. His father and mother, when this arrangement was made, did not know that it was from the Lord. Why? For he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. What is this? The reason he doesn't bust the father-in-law's chops but goes after the whole nation is because God is seeking an opportunity. Now, dear ones, don't miss the point. The point here is that Samson is a jerk. And God is going to weave his jerkness into his plan to protect his people. Right? This is what he's doing. God wove Samson's weakness into his plan and fulfilled his purpose despite Samson's failings. I hope that's encouraging to you. Is that encouraging to you? I hope that's encouraging to you. Samson, you know, what happens with this thing? The worst nightmare of Samson's father-in-law and his original bride come true. The Philistines come and burn them with fire. And what does Samson do? He, he absolutely goes off the chain. His anger turns into wrath. He goes out and, and smites them hip and thigh. What do you imagine that was? We're not told. But it wasn't anything good. And Samson says, that's what I'm going to do. And so Samson goes off the chain. Samson, what is, what, are we, what is the picture here? And here's what I want you to notice. None of this is happening because Samson intended it to happen. None of this is happening because Samson said, I'm going to do God's will. What's going on here is that Samson is simply following the path dictated by his lusts and his emotions. That is Samson's weakness, and God wove Samson's weakness into his plan to fulfill his will. George Will has written a wonderful book on the craft of baseball, Men at Work. I commend it to you. If you're a baseball fan, it's a lot of fun to read, and it's spiced with occasional bits of wisdom. And my favorite quote from the book is this one, in marriage and baseball and other difficult endeavors in life, the perfect is the enemy of the good. The perfect is the enemy of the good. It's good to remember that. We're programmed in our day to think that we have to have just the right man and the perfect program if God's will is going to be fulfilled. We've missed understanding a truth that we badly need to be gripped by. And that is that God weaves our imperfections into his plan and fulfills his will in spite of who we are, not because of who we are. Because we don't realize this, we're forever being disappointed by people that we set up as demigods in the, in the church. We make heroes out of people that should, we should never make heroes out of. There's only one hero, and his name is Jesus. Every human instrument is liable to fail you, including the one who's standing in front of you tonight. Do not put your faith in men. Do not put your faith in women. It is God, it is God who is the strength. And he picks up these fragile, frail instruments, you know, that, that we just look like we're just, yeah, we just look, sometimes we just look like we're dumber than a bag of hammers, right? And, and God uses us anyway. God uses us anyway, and that's what he did with Samson. And furthermore, it's not just that we make heroes out of people we shouldn't make heroes out of, 
but we constantly undervalue the contribution that we ourselves can make. We constantly undervalue the, the contribution that we ourselves can make to the work of the Lord. Imagining that only special people are used by God. Perfect people, really. One of the great damaging things that fundamentalism has done to Christianity in the United States is to cause us to demand perfection. It's been damaging to the body of Christ. We demand perfection. We think that God can only use perfect people. We forget a principle that every baseball player has to remind himself of every day, that the perfect is the enemy of the good. In striving to be perfect, we often neglect to fulfill what is good. Because we're not perfect, we don't try to do it at all. Striving to be perfect, we neglect to fulfill what is good. God doesn't neglect this principle. God doesn't overlook it. God doesn't need perfect, perfect servants to fulfill his purposes on planet Earth. <clears throat> Excuse me. God doesn't need perfect servants to fulfill his purposes on planet Earth. Aren't you glad? Isn't that good news? Now, dear ones, this is good news. I mean, this really is. In the end, he just uses people like us. We are old clay pots. Cracked, worn out, not suitable for so many things, and yet when the glory of Jesus Christ comes to live in that old clay pot, what happens? The glory shines through, you know. The glory shines through. It's not us, it's him. Relax. You're all he's got and you're all he needs. Secondly, the Philistine's worst nightmare. I perceive that I'm going to have to move right along. Can I get an amen? The Philistine's worst nightmare. doesn't matter. That was the big point anyway, so you got it. The Philistines' worst nightmare. What happens? The Philistines, if Samson thinks this thing is going to be over with. Samson says, I'm going to do this and then I will quit. That's what he says in verse 7. So Samson says, score is settled. Everything's done. It's over with. The Philistines say, not so fast. Not so fast. The Philistines come up and encamp in Judah and make a raid on Lehi, we're told, in verse 9. And the men of Judah say, why have you come up against us? Remember, the Philistines... The Philistines are the oppressing force. They are, they are the Nazis in occupied France, right? I mean, the, the people of Judah are an occupied people on this side of, uh, of uh, the Jordan River. And the Philistines are the ones who are ruling over them. And so they perceive that the Philistines are not happy. They come up and make a raid. And they say to them, why have you done this? And the Philistines said... We're here to take it out on Samson. We're going to do to Samson what Samson did to us. Now, the people of God do what people who are under occupation most of the time do when the jackboot of the oppressor is put on their neck. They don't raise an army to join Samson, the liberator. They raise an army to go get the liberator and turn him over to the enemy. They collaborate. And so here is the nation of Israel. What are they doing? They're not going to follow God's instrument. The nation, unworthy, that nation is going to do the will of the enemy. They're going to collaborate. And so what do they do? They go down. They find Samson. And they say to Samson, what are you doing? Don't you know that the Philistines are ruling over us? Why did you do this? And Samson said, I did to them what they did to me. Do you see that there's a commonality here? What do the Philistines say they're looking for in Samson? We want an eye for an eye. What does Samson say he wants from the Philistines? We want an eye for an eye. Everybody in this story wants an eye for an eye. And everybody in this story ends up making the whole world blind because they're going to poke each other in the eye. And that's what humanity does unless God intervenes. 
That's what humanity does unless God intervenes. But God intervened. So, Samson, an interesting thing, you know, Samson is the strongest guy in the world. So his own people say, we're going to take you captive. And he says, promise me you won't kill me. Okay, we won't kill you. So they bind him with ropes. If Samson is so strong, why doesn't he just fight off the Israelites? Because God didn't give him his strength to fight the Israelites. He gave him his strength to fight the Philistines. So what happens? The Philistines see him coming. Verse 14, when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. They think they have achieved their goal. What happens? Their worst nightmare has just walked into their presence. Because when Samson gets there, the Spirit of the Lord rushes upon him and the ropes on his arms become like flax that caught fire and the bonds melt off. And he finds the fresh jawbone of a donkey and he puts it out, out his hand and took it and struck a thousand men. He heaps them up. And as soon as he's finished speaking, he throws the jawbone out of his hand. And that place is called Ramoth Lehi. What's the point here? The point is that God turns man's wrath into man's judgment. God turns man's wrath. He turns the wrath of man into an instrument for man's punishment. The Philistines come down in wrath. God intervenes and makes it their punishment. Have you ever been so angry about something that you couldn't speak coherently? You ever, you ever get so mad, something unexpected happens or, or something that's so outrageous, something that is so infuriating, and you want to say words and nothing will come out except, I, I, right? You ever, you, ever get so, you ever get so mad that that happens? What happens when you do that? Everybody laughs, right? It doesn't matter how mad you are. You know, if you could just be decently mad, you would intimidate people and make them feel bad. But when you get to that point where it's so outrageous that you can't even speak, everybody just laughs. In that moment, truly, our wrath is turned back on our own heads, making us look very human and very silly all at the same time. Verses 10 and 11 talk to us about this matter of an eye for an eye. Now, what do we get out of this? I want to caution you. Be careful how you handle your anger. Be careful how you handle your anger. Anger legitimately arises when an injustice has been done. It is not a sin for us to be angry when injustice has occurred. As a matter of fact, it is a right thing for us to be angry when an injustice has occurred. But when we do not deal with that immediately and we let it turn into wrath, this overflowing, this speechless rage that drives us to do things that are ultimately foolish, allowing our anger to overflow into wrath seldom helps the situation. Samson poked the Philistines in the eye, so to speak, and they sought to poke him right back. But God was in the whole thing, intervening to punish the oppressors of his people. And that not for the last time. Jesus came offering peace to an undeserving world, but many scorn his gift to this day. Someday Jesus will return to recompense man's wrath by turning it back on his own head. In the meantime... You and I are called to be men and women of peace in the face of oppression. We are called to be people of peace in the face of oppression. Jesus is going to settle the score when he returns. You don't have to. I'm with people. And when you try to defend yourself, it only makes it worse. You just need to, you just need to do what's right. Always do what's right. And, and carry on because when Jesus comes... When Jesus comes, he'll settle the ultimate issues. He'll settle the ultimate issues. Last point, the revived servant. Although Samson was a highly imperfect instrument, God wasn't finished with him yet. He revived his flagging servant and preserved him for further service, as these verses tell us. Uh, Samson was very thirsty, and he called upon the Lord and said, You've granted me this great salvation by the hand of your servant. 
And shall I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Samson is like Elijah after defeating the prophets of Baal. Remember the story? Samson defeats the 400 prophets of Baal, and afterwards he, he has to go off into the desert and pout. Why? Because the guy is just exhausted. He's exhausted. And Samson has won this great victory, and he's exhausted. And, and wouldn't, it be, it, wouldn't it be appropriate for the Lord to now say to Samson, well, Samson, you didn't really win that victory. I'm the one who won that victory. I'm the one who did that, you know, not you. It's not you and the jawbone of the donkey. It was me. And by the way, Samson, you're not even doing this because you want to do what I want you to do. You're doing this just because you're, you're, you're being run by your emotions. And you're doing this because you're being run by your own lusts and desires. Samson, why should I give you a drink of water? And what does God do? Splits the rock, says, take a drink. Get it back together. What in the world? What is God doing here? What God is doing is he's preserving his instrument until he's finished with him because he's not finished with him yet. He's not finished with him yet. God is faithful to preserve his servants until the work that he calls them to do is finished. You know, there are certain people on planet Earth who seem to live a charmed life. These people, some of them good and some of them bad, seem to be providentially protected from fatal injury or even economic disaster until the role that they play in history finally comes to its conclusion. Winston Churchill was one of those people, but so was Adolf Hitler. Their lives were preserved until they had finished the task that God had written into history for them to do. You know, in God's sovereignty over history, Nobody passes off the scene until God has accomplished his purposes through them. Samson certainly furnishes us with an illustration of that principle. Samson was a very imperfect instrument, and his imperfections were entirely his own fault. God gifted Samson with everything he could possibly need. But selfish Samson chose to squander the gifts but God did not cast Samson away. He preserved him until the task that Samson was assigned was completed. And that is the graciousness of God, but there's an even greater graciousness. Samson not only was preserved until he finished his work, but after he finished his work, his name is written in to Hebrews 11. Grace. 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 We can't say it too often. It isn't us. It's grace. It isn't us. It's grace. God wrote Samson's name into Hebrews 11, the Hall of Fame. And that is what grace does, dear friends. It picks up the undeserving and uses us for God's glory and then preserves our names forever as if we are the hero of the story, but we are not. We are not the hero of the story. We don't deserve to have our names written down in glory, but because of what Jesus did for us, our names are there by God's grace. And like all the other names that are in Hebrews 11, Samson did not deserve to have his name there. But God makes the foolish wise. He makes the weak strong. He makes the dirty clean. And he makes the failing, the flailing finishers. The miracle of Samson and you and me is the miracle of grace. It's a miracle of grace. God's purposes cannot be frustrated by our foolishness. God weaves our weaknesses into his plan. He turns wrath back on the wrathful. He preserves even his most unpromising servants until we've completed our, our assignment. And then he writes our names forever in the book of life. Only God can write this story. Aren't you glad that he didn't wait for you to be perfect before he wrote you into his story. Amen? Amen. 
Father, your grace is amazing and wonderful. We sing amazing grace. We really do. Same guy wrote amazing grace as, as wrote that line, his mercy is more. It's John Newton. It's your grace coming out. Grace, grace, grace. That guy was a preacher of grace. And here it comes in all of his hymns. And Lord, we, we worship you. We, we praise you because you are a God of grace. You don't wait for us to clean up our act. You do not wait for us to get our stuff together. You are not waiting for us to become perfect and somehow beautifully perfect instruments for you to use. You pick up what you've got at hand. You pick up the jawbone of the donkey and slay thousands. And sometimes we're the jawbone of the donkey. And you use us to the praise of your glory. And the glory goes to you. Your mercy really is more. Thank you, Father. Thank you. In Jesus' name, hear our prayer. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand and close by singing doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Above the heavenly host, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And let's pray together. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for coming. See you next week.